you know, we're talking to Jeff Hay. He's from New Zealand. He's here on the California Waterfowls New Zealand Hunter Exchange. Uh, this program started over 30 years ago by a couple of CWA volunteers, um, Tony and Pete Arnold and Matt Keller. Um, basically, we're running this with CWA's name. And, and 30 years ago, they used to raffle off a spot to go back out to New Zealand and, and be, you know, hosted by everyone back there. And then you guys, you guys kind of anyone in the community that is fairly highly regarded, you guys will send back to Yeah. Us. How, do you, how do you guys make your selection or? Uh, well, for, I'll, from, I'm probably the last person that'll come that's not employed by our fish and game. Oh, okay. Uh, that's, that's the uh, indication I got. I had the opportunity four years ago, they asked me to come, but with COVID happening and everything mm-hmm. and other reasons, so I, I couldn't make the trip. Yeah. Um, so I feel pretty privileged on my end that I was selected to do it. Yeah. My age, of course. Yeah. Well, um, when John emailed, he's like, hey, you know, just 71, he's like, but don't let the age fool you. And like <laughs> I told you earlier, man, you, you, you get around and you keep up like, no one I've ever seen in terms of even someone that's 40 years old, you know, yeah. but, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure having you out here and, uh, it sounds like you've enjoyed yourself. It's always hard kind of on our end if, to know if you've enjoyed the experience or, you know, kind of the ups and downs of it. It, it can be a little wild in terms of day to day. You don't necessarily know what you're going to be doing, uh, just cause so many different variables, yeah. but, um, yeah. I've, um, I've got to admit, in the last couple of days, I've started to feel a bit tired. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I would expect that after. I would think so. Tenth, but, but really, I felt great. You know, like I've been enthusiastic every morning, like I do at home. Yeah, yeah. Like I could shoot the day before and the day after and keep going, and it just every morning you get that same adrenaline rush. Doesn't matter whether it's the first day or the last day. So. Yeah, and that just sustains you. So. And you're on the North Island of New Zealand. Yeah, the North Island of New Zealand about. Uh, an hour and 10 minutes, I suppose, uh, southeast of Auckland. So I live towards the east coast, about 15 kilometres inland. Same thing as the Sacramento Valley, really. We're a very flat area, Haraki Plains. Uh, I've got two major rivers that run either side of my property with a 25,500 acre Kopuatai peat dome. So it's a big peat area, which like the Haraki Plains is peat. Uh, and my property backs into that, so I live there. I've got a waterfowl or trying to create a waterfowl breeding area, Mm -hmm. only small 40 acres, which in the scheme of things over there is reasonable, in the scheme of things in California is (laughs) significant, (laughs) as I've seen. Uh, Yeah, I live there with my partner and my dog. Mm -hmm. Uh, I hunt every day in New Zealand, but we've got a short season uh, in the Auckland Waikato fishing game area, which is where I, where that area is. Just how many days? Pardon? How many days? Well, a month, 31 days. Yeah. Generally. yeah. First Saturday in May, every year, the whole se- the whole country starts on the first Saturday in May. Okay. Uh, different license, uh, different restrictions in each fish and game area, uh, different season links and different start and finish times. Very different to what you've got over here. Yeah. And, yeah. One well, of the weirdest things was the very first day that Jeff got here, we went out to the rice blind and said, well, shoot time, we got about 15 minutes. He goes, your shoot time isn't the same every morning and every afternoon? I said, no. <laughs> I said, we got to know what we're shooting at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is, that is. I've, I've actually found that really good, especially the sunset rule in the evening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like generally a lot of our shooting, particularly in cutover maize fields um, and in just in our paddocks basically, which have got either chicory in them or just very good grass because most of the area around me is dairy farming, so... They know how to grow grass, obviously. Um, so we shoot until you can't see, basically. Like quarter past, half past six in my area, and half past six down south. Some of the places are quarter past six. Half past six, quarter past six start in the morning, every day. But the every reason day. for that is because? Just, no, there is that no reason. That's how it is always Well, But, always you, but you guys don't have the limits like we do for certain birds, so you guys don't have to ID in the dark. Correct. Correct. Yeah. We've only got four different species of ducks, so um, Allard obviously being the, the number one bird over there. We've got a grey duck, which is a native grey duck, but what's happened is the Mallards and the greys have bred together and they've created a, a duck we call a grey lard. 
oh yeah, part grey, part mallards. So instead of having a limit on mallards and a limit on grey ducks, which we used to have, they've just called it grey lard. So, and we have a, a shovel or a spoon ball, like the one on the wall over there. Mm-hmm. And, and are they highly regarded or are they talked down to like they are in California? It, it depends on which region you're in. <laughs> oh. like in my area... And in the, in the swamps where I shoot, they're uh, not a prolific bird. Mm-hmm. I allow the people that shoot in my blind, which there's four of us in my blind, They, if one comes in, they are allowed to shoot one drake. But to even actually see one drake, is, you, know, you might not even see one for the whole yeah. season. So there's not many there. <clears throat> in the other areas, um, closer to the coast and very shallow water, yes, there are a lot of, a lot of shoveler or spoon balls there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as far as eating them, we'll eat anything in New Zealand. So. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what's your guys' bag limit per day for, uh, for depths? The bag limit, the, the worst bag limit is in the eastern region, which is adjacent to the Auckland Waikato area. So that's the Bay of Plenty area of New Zealand, basically. And the east coast, uh, the limit there is six birds. That's mallard, greylards, two shoveler, uh, Ten paradise shell ducks. So, okay, and then you can shoot two to ten black swans, depending on. And the regions themselves, like the eastern region, for example, is split into four areas, A one to A four, and they have got different links, uh, different limits in each of those areas, particularly on the paradise shell duck, because it it hangs out in certain areas and not in others. Gotcha. Uh, so there are lots of different. Lots but in, in your area, 30-day season, how many ducks can you shoot a day? Eight grey lards and two spoon balls. So, so ten, ten a day. Ten a day. day, yeah. And you pretty much, you're saying, shoot your limit almost every day. Almost every day. Yeah. I think twice last year that I didn't shoot a limit. Wow. wow. But one of the things that I was surprised about when we talked was there's a region that you guys have that's three months long, and the, the mallard limit was what? 50 a day, 20 a day, something like that? That is correct. That is correct. Uh, The further south you go, I mean, we've got less population. Yeah. New Zealand's only got 6 million people, so, and most of those live in the North Island, uh, and most of those live in Auckland, our biggest city, 1.2 million. But the further south, the less populated, less hunter pressure on the birds. So, and it's a great prolific breeding area in in certain parts of the South Island. Same thing. A lot of barley grown, a lot of maize grown, a lot of dairying. So there's plenty of food down there for them. Great habitat. Uh, so the, yeah, the bird limit, the best bird limit down that area is 50 a day. Jesus, that's, that's 50 mallards. 50 mallards a day. <laughs> and like people that have got uh, good blinds, good areas to hunt in, they will shoot 50 greenheads mm. on the opening weekend each day. On the opening weekend, they don't shoot any ends. They might shoot one by mistake. But, wow. They will try and shoot 50 green heads. Wow. Some people don't shoot 50 green heads in their life in California. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've, I'm, I'm like, I haven't seen that many green heads over here. So. Yeah. I was going to say, when we hunted the rice, like, oh, mallards, mallards. And you're probably like, uh, I want to shoot other ducks. <laughs> <laughs> We're all excited for mallards in the rice. And, well, it was actually quite yeah. funny, wasn't it? Okay. All the way from New Zealand, and the first duck I shot was a mallard. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of people would be like, wow, you guys shoot mallards out of your blind or whatever. You know, that's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, I was telling someone actually yesterday at a, at a baseball thing about um, you being out here, but how you were talking about the birds going out into the ocean and roosting out in the ocean. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so that's essentially what our ducks do. They don't go and hide inland. Certainly we've, they hide on, on, uh, on the bigger water rivers or they'll hide on the refuges that we have. Mm-hmm. which are not huge like yours. So they might go into a town reserve, for example, or they will all go out in the ocean and they'll raft on the ocean for a month or whatever the season is. And they'll come in at night, particularly when the moon's out. They come in at night and feed and they go out first thing in the morning, mostly before shooting time starts. They'll raft there. They're able to drink the water, obviously. Uh, so we've there is another way of hunting those, of course, out in the sea. Mm-hmm. Uh, we use gunboats. Turn them gunboats, uh, pretty much like we saw out towards Quimby Island, the, the boats that sit yeah, there. Yeah, big, big floaters out on Yeah, French big track. floaters out there. They're, they're just camouflage boats, they're mm-hmm. not actually a blind. Oh, okay. Yeah, they actually camouflage boats. They camo them up with, uh, with mangroves, 
grow prolifically along the water the edge line there. But they change position most days. They can't, they don't just sit in one spot. They're not restricted to one spot. They can go wherever they like. So you follow the birds around. Either good, because you get the birds coming from inland in the morning, but you have to work the tides. I mean, you can only mm. get in out the har- harbour into or the, the river entrances at certain tides. Mm-hmm. So you're restricted in that way. But the shooting can be fantastic. But it can also be very frustrating. Yeah. Okay. You could have... Two or three thousand ducks sitting with two hundred meters there, and you, and it's very hard to get one duck to come into your decoys when there's that many sitting <laughs> right. there. So. Yeah, and when the ducks are coming in to feed at night, you're talking about the the maize or the cornfields. That's primarily all dry land that they're coming in and eating on. Correct. Not a lot of it's flooded, or if any it is flooded. No, not unless we get a heavy rain. I mean, this past season I was shooting in a in a maize field, cut over maize field, right on the coast boundary and behind the mangroves. We had uh, a little township on one side, so we had a fairly sh- small shooting area to shoot in. You had to be a bit careful where the shot fall went. Uh, and while we were there, it continued to rain. And we were in layout blinds. In the end, we had over two inches of water like <laughs> layout blind. Huh. And we had, and the friend I shoot was only got one leg, so we had to try and drag those to higher ground. Yeah. Uh, Exceptional shooting, though, just ducks after duck. They were coming off the sea, coming in to feed in big big lots. Certainly not as big as the lots I've seen flying around here, but, you know, 50 birds or more at a time. Yeah. Uh, that shot really well. There was a downside. We got the ute stuck in the middle of the paddock, and it took <laughs> another ute plus <laughs> quite a few hours to get it out. So, yeah. Uh, but generally it's all in dry paddocks. Yeah. Gotcha. If they... A lot of the younger guys there use robo ducks in particular, and they will find a flight path coming off the sea, set those up just in a paddock so long as you're under that flight path, and they have exceptional shooting in the evening. Okay. Yeah. If you had that sunset rule over there, that probably wouldn't happen. Yeah. The birds, you know, they about five thirty, they fly. You know. Mm. So and that's about sunset too over there. But when it's dark like that for the the ducks, you can't use any um, light, but you can for the Canada geese, which are a pest or a nuisance or whatever you guys have it categorized. Yes, they uh, yeah, you can't use any any uh, any light shooting game species. So the Canada goose was was a game species, but that's been taken off the game bird list, instigated by our farmers over there who were um, uh, getting hammered by the Canadas in their paddocks lobbied the government and got it taken off the game bird list about seven or eight years ago. So uh, you can shoot those day and night. You can shoot them with whatever you want. You can use a light on them, whatever. It's great. Health. And, and they come right to the light from what I under, have understood? Yes, when you, uh, when, you, when you put the light on them, they will fly directly at the spotlight. Wow. <laughs> Absolutely. They'll turn right angles when they're flying and fly directly at the spotlight. That's wild. That is absolutely wild. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like it's great shooting. It's, <laughs> it's just something you need to experience. So do you have someone being the light guy and then Correct. another guy the shooter? Yeah. Yeah. You have two people generally. Um, you try and get a, a spotlight that's got a wide beam on it. So. Mm-hmm. And uh, so long as you've got good hearing in particular, which I haven't got, (laughs) Uh, and you can hear the wings calling or whatever, and at the right moment, put the light on. Gotcha. They'll just fly straight at you. Wow. And you could shoot them. Well, I was talking to a couple of the other guys that hosted me here, and they'd done it when they were out in the South Island. Yeah. And one actually hit them in the chest when it came down. Oh, Oh, jeez. That's how close you're shooting them. Yeah, wow. big honker like that. Big, yeah. Kid, all, yeah. all Canadian. It's not going to feel like, feel very good. Yeah. I know one of the things that we had talked about, you're talking about feeding, and it still baffles me, is the acorns, them, the ducks eating the acorns. I don't know if you've heard about this, but Jeff was saying that, I think it was a dry year, you found all those ducks with acorns in them. He said, any acorn tree, there'd be ducks sitting under looking up at the tree, waiting for an acorn to drop. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's been like that from uh, ever since I can remember. Really, like oh, really? The, the ducks. Even when I was at school, the, we had acorn trees around the around the playing fields. And uh, during the duck season, the ducks. Well, before the duck season, when the acorns fell, the birds would all be there. And, you know, and you'd yeah. be playing amongst the ducks, basically. So, 
that's wild because I mean our ducks only eat acorns and it's just wood ducks basically and when it's flooded, flooded they yeah. won't go when it's dry and stare up at a tree and hope for one falls down yeah I'm a bit surprised really because California's got a lot of oak trees mm-hmm. maybe they just haven't figured it out yet oh I don't know we've I mean we've we've got oak trees too they're not the same variety I guess mm-hmm. but all oak trees produce acorns so yeah, yeah. One, one thing I did find like in the area I used to shoot only a certain type of acorn, which is the English English oak ro- rober, uh, they would eat those. But up in where I am now, they will actually eat the northern pin oak, which is a real little hard as acorn. And I found those in ducks after I shot them. So why yeah. that is, I have no idea. Yeah, just what's available, I suppose. Right, and I, that's probably why you don't see that here. There's probably just so much other. Food sources available that might be easier to rice, too. rice mm. exactly yeah. flooded corn, you know those mm. types of things. Well, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Why why would you eat a hard acorn when you can eat <laughs> soft rice? Yeah. yeah, right. And then go sit underneath the tree all day <laughs> and on Butte Creek or something like that, right? So, yeah. yeah. But uh, tell us about your growing up. I thought that was an interesting, you know, growing up. Well, from about the age of four, probably was when I was became an obsessed duck hunter. <laughs> um, I grew up in the Rotorua area of, of the Bay of Plenty. Uh, we grew up in one of the lakes there, Lake Rotorua. Uh, thousands of waterfowl there, but all grey ducks, no mallards at all in the, when I was a kid. Um, my father was a sawmill there. We lived in the bush, hunted there excess, you know, obsessively as well. Um, but from about the age of four, when I could sort of get around pretty good, I would go down on opening morning, I would go down to to the lake and stalk around all the blinds. The shooters were annoyed, of course, at first, but eventually <laughs> they, they couldn't stop me and they accepted me and said, and I'd go around and collect all the cartridges. Okay. Sniff the gunpowder. <laughs> and uh, and the, we scrub all our blinds with the manuka over there, so just a native shrub where the manuka honey comes from. Um, we scrub our blinds with that and the smell of manuka and the smell of gunpowder, especially with the old paper-cased so-called smokeless powder yeah. shells. Uh, it was just, it, it just bit me and I've had it ever since. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I grew, I've, I learned to shoot on big water. Uh, our blinds were, were set 100 to 200 metres out in the lake, shallow lake, just a square maybe a two-man blind. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of times you could push the boat underneath it and step up into the blind. We'd use cork decoys. That's all. We never had any plastic decoys or nothing from over this way until the later years. We, One or two New Zealand makers started making decoys, plastic decoys, uh, which were pretty successful. But the grey duck, because it was predominant then, you could. we used to put out a... a, a Flagon, like a flagon was a glass jar of about two quarts, painted black, tie a string on it, throw a weight on it, and those were our decoys. Oh, wow. Those were our decoys. And if you were lucky enough to have a duck call, you used a duck call, which was a a wooden, an old wooden call with a brass reed in it. So it didn't sound that great like the the latest calls we've got now. But it did the trick with the grey ducks. So by the time I started shooting, I was 12 grandfather and I and my father. Three generations in the Mai Mai. Mai Mai is the term we use for a blind. Yeah. Uh, not sure about that. It's a Maori word, Mount Mai Mai. Um, by the time I got to shoot, the mallards had just sort of started to appear. And the first season I shot, uh, you were allowed 10 grey ducks. And f- if, if you could find them, five mallard drakes. That was a, and that was a 19... 19- 66, I think it was, when I first started, so a long time ago. And then progressively, within less than 10 years probably, you would be shooting 12 mallards and three rays. That's oh, wow. the, just the tide just turned the other way. And it's been like that ever since, basically. And that's why now we call them grey lards, etc. even though there are pockets of pure grey ducks around the country. But they just call them all radars. You can't. Our, our mallards are not beautiful big greenies like yours. <laughs> they have anything from pure black to pure white. 
and all the colours in between. Oh, really? They all have that same speculum. Yeah. Uh, but the colouring, just incredible. White ring around the neck, or is that completely gone? No, something with nothing. Nothing. That's, just, that's, that's wild. And I've got ducks sitting that I'm going to get mounted that are, that are black. Huh. They've got a slight green tinge over the whole, whole duck, but pure black. And I've also got a pure white one. Huh. So, yeah, when I when I show people photos of the ones I've got, they just can't believe they're mallards. Yeah. They're just so different. Yeah, especially from out here where we're at, it's pretty distinct, you know, oh. colorization from bird to bird. Earlier in the season, the plumage, but this time of the year, you're nice, yeah. big, fat. Yeah. It, I think your ducks are a little bit bigger than ours too. Mm-hmm. Really. You know, the ones I've, I've uh, managed to... The bag here have certainly been a little bit bigger than ours. Think fatter, like the fat was a lot thicker. No, not fatter, just a bigger duck overall. I think. Okay. Yeah. I know that when they introduced the mallard into New Zealand way back, they originally introduced the English strain, which are really captive release mallards yeah. over there, yep. and they were too tame. And they tried for years and years to get it established, but tame duck <laughs> and a lot of fruit. They and of course they brought their predators with them. So it didn't really survive, and, and it wasn't until they brought um, the mallard from California that it, that it took over. Oh, really? Yeah. So that was, I can't remember the date, 1950s probably. Yeah. What's, uh, I mean, now that you've traveled, you know, decent part of the state hunting around, what's been the favorite place that you've, you've hunted at so far um, just on your travels? Oh, I think Quimby Island was the Quimby Island. Yeah, I mean, I have about it. Just the whole experience. Mm -hmm. I think I have shot more ducks elsewhere, Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not all about shooting more ducks. For me, it's just the experience. I mean, going out on the boat, especially Mm -hmm. in the dark, (laughs) with with the chief finding his way with the GPS. That was was, (laughs) I had never seen that system before. (laughs) I'm sure we've got it, but I haven't seen it. Uh, And then, yeah, just I mean, I felt very, very privileged, privileged going out there. That was pretty special. Yeah. And we shot well, and it was so different. We shot out of a blind with a mud motor on it that I'd never never shot out of before. No so, mud motors in New Zealand? Not yeah, like the odd one, but we haven't yeah. really got any call for them. You know, like, yeah. yeah. Uh, one or two people down south use them, but uh, none up our way at all. Pretty rarely, yeah. Very rarely. And the amount of work Jeff put into <laughs> manoeuvring it around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we moved a couple times, and then I finally found the sweet yeah. spot. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I think I got a picture at like eight or a text message. You guys had like two, and then it was like two hours later, and it was like done. Like, wow, that yeah. must have happened quick. Yeah, so that was that was cool. Um, we never hunted there like that. Mm. Um, that was a, a new addition, and um, we had some other people there then in, in a traditional blind and what we would consider you know the spot to be in, and, and we were just kind of free roam in a mm. unit that was too deep to walk in, really, for the most mm. part. Um, yeah, and it kind of worked out. It was kind of fun to oh, it tinker with it a little bit. And yeah. um, I was shocked the dog did okay with never being in a boat before, never trained for that. So that was cool. And um, shot a little bit of everything. You shot some teal, mallards. You shot, I think you got your the first snow, snow, goose snow goose that day. Yeah. Uh, there was a wood duck in that pile. There, there was, was a wood duck. And a, and a speck. We got a couple of specks. Yep. Yeah. 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 We never did shoot a ring neck there, but there was some around. I don't no. think there was anything close, but... No. Yeah, uh, the whole experience, and then and then coming back in the rough. Like, <laughs> <You're coming laughs> oh, yeah, I said you guys might get wet on the way oh, back. In. I, I actually laughed. I mean, I was sitting in the front seat. I was pretty wet, but the, <laughs> yeah. the, the girl was there. The woman was there shooting. Like she didn't realize, I think, and right on that last wave. That, yeah, it was literally like it was. It was really, really rough. And then I hit like the worst wave before the calm and the slew. Yeah. And it, you could just see it. It just, just hit the bow and just boom. There you go, <laughs> drench. <laughs> yeah, drench. Uh, uh, but yeah, no, the other group had a great hunt too. So that was a that was a special day. That was really that cool. was a special. Day. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, I've shot more ducks in other places, and uh, they've been everything's been enjoyable. I've got no complaints on this trip. It's exceeded my expectations. Um, one thing I would like to say is that. We get our perception of Americans in particular is what we see on TV to a lot of us. I mean, mm-hmm. we d- you don't believe most of it, but over a period of time you get a little bit brainwashed. 
and coming out here, and particularly coming north, Sacramento north in that area where we've been hunting, the people have been so polite. I just, mm-hmm. yeah, it's absolutely blown me away. You know, you're just even more polite than than the South Island people in New Zealand who are exceptionally polite, like us North Islanders. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, and the whole experience really just uh, complete strangers just yeah. saying hello, thanking you for whatever, and you know it's I've, it's touched me. So yeah, yeah. That, that's good. I, I think you know we we get that a lot with people that are from other states, mm-hmm. and they think of California in general, and we're our own little you know universe over here. So yeah, people get this misconception, but um, I think to your point the hunting community as a whole, you know, there's a lot of really, really good folks yeah. out there that you meet. And, and I think you met a lot of those folks during your trip. Yeah, I certainly did, uh, you know, and I, people from all walks of life too, not one mm-hmm. particular yeah. you know, demographic or anything, you know, it was just, um, the hosts I've been with have been fantastic. They've showed me other things other than hunting, like wine tasting and different things. Uh, and the Mexican food has been Great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think my eyes at certain times have been too big for my belly, but we've had uh, had some great meals. So we just have terrible coffee, though, right? Yeah, well, that's one thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 give, I'll give that to you. Yeah, I, I haven't got much hair left, but I don't think I've got any left now. After <laughs> that coffee. Uh, is, is there something that? you wish you would have did or like that I would have coordinated before you get in here in terms of uh, a trip or something that you didn't see that, you know, you're leaving tomorrow, you know, afternoon, evening. As far as hunting or as far as doing something different? Yeah, anything. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you asked me when I talked to you before I came out whether I wanted to do any sightseeing. And and yes, I probably should have gone sightseeing, but being an obsessed hunter, that yeah, yeah. you know, that, but I mean, you could have go over to Yosemite maybe and had a look. It's not that far away, so I'll come back there. So, yeah, yeah. So. All right. Yeah, it's it's hard to give up a day when you're here for a certain amount of time to go hunting to go do something that isn't hunting, and then you think, oh, what would I just miss out on? You know, with your yeah, limited right. amount of time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I um, yeah, just an obsessed hunter, so especially ducks. Yeah, and, and it's hard for me to not hunt. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, I know it. it it's, I'm I'm with you there, but you were uh, like I said, you. Were, a lot of people I think would have been burnt out. So you've been here since January 10th. 10th. It's mm-hmm. January 20, 29th. 20, 29th Sunday or Monday. 29th, yeah, wow. So you've been here for a while, and you've hunted almost every day, and and we've had you up and down the state, kind of, <laughs> and all, all over with different hosts. Um, so that's kind of on, on our end or on my end, I'm always kind of like trying to fit so much in a short period of time, but not make you feel like you're just running the whole time either. Yeah, yeah. So I think this trip was a little bit nicer than in the past where you were kind of regionally for multiple stays yeah. and then packing a bag and then going somewhere else where sometimes in the past it's been, okay, this host could only hunt on Wednesdays. All right, then we got to drive an hour to get to that host, then pick you up to go somewhere else, you know. Um, and before you booked your trip, I was like, hey, it's January. It could flood, you know, <laughs> and it did. And it, 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 it did. Right flood. at the end. Uh, yeah, so we had been staying at Sanborn Slough there in the bunkhouse and then hunting um, our rice club. And then some neighboring properties aren't, aren't too far off, Sabaya, a duck club, et cetera. Um, but it was good to just kind of have a central point for a while. But that whole area flooded out where we had to close it actually on on Saturday just because the water was too deep. Yeah. So yeah, well, it, was, it was quite bad when we escaped. So. Oh, yeah. yeah we, were, we were leaving there while the water was coming up. That's yeah. true. I forgot all about that. Getting chased out by the flood. Yeah, man. Yeah. But um, I think you timed it just right in terms of it's been a very odd season. Yeah. Very I'd warm. Agree with that. Very warm. But... I, you put together some really good hunts opportunities even the first day that you were here and, and all three of us shared the blind yeah, together. You, you probably killed more ducks than a lot of people killed their whole season in California <laughs> in a two week span. Yeah. That's yeah. the truth. Yeah, that I mean the whole the whole 
20 odd days that I've been here have been an experience, something I, I don't do at home and we haven't got the opportunity to do at home and particularly the, the rice blinds, the pit blinds, we don't have pit blinds in New Zealand, yeah. they're, they're very foreign some, and some of the ones I've shot here are, are good and some are not so good <laughs> <laughs> uh, What do you think of our setup? Uh, your setup is ideal. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Appreciate the best, best setup. You need to bring back the, the blade idea. That's, you're going to be the only one in New Zealand with a blade. The big the metal spinning, spinning blade. Spinning oh, blade. correct. Yeah. Yes, yes. The big, uh, the big, the big spinner. Robo, the yeah. robo blade. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's something I'd never seen before. So I made, made, made sure that I took photos and, and printed that into my memory so that when I go home, I'll do that. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. imagine being the first person to show a duck that. They must. Come oh, right in. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, it's either going to work or you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'd never I'd, like even on YouTube or anything else. We haven't seen anything like that. So yeah, it's yeah. kind of a well the the Mojo Duck, the the mm. Robo Duck. It was invented in California. It really kind of spawned from that blade originally, yeah. and people started putting duck bodies on it. And then yeah. Mojo originally bought somebody out here or whatever. But um, we still use them. A lot of people still do. You look at it and you'd be like, there's no way that thing. You probably looked at it and was like, <laughs> yeah. what is that? I'm like, yeah, we use, yeah, I so we use. I yeah. Right? Yeah. But you look well, at it and you're like, there's no way. And you know? then those pintail come right Straight into it. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like uh, going back a few years, I was the first person in the I hunted public areas. Like a lot of people in New Zealand, we've got a lot of public land hunting. And I was the first person amongst the area where I shot, which probably had uh, 20 stand-up blinds, not pit blinds, stand-up blinds with two men, two men blinds. I was probably the first person there to get a robo duck. That was probably 1990 or thereabouts, <laughs> quite early in the piece, the very original robo that ever came out. Yeah. And uh, from that moment forward, I was hated. So. <laughs> yeah. And that probably tells you what happened at the shooting. So. No, nobody got a chance. Yeah. Well, I can remember that. Like when where I grew up, a, f- a friend they had one, and you know, they were they were good hunters. But like, I saw them from a distance, and just birds were just like coming out of the sky. I was like, "What is going on?" And they're like, mm-hmm. "Oh, one of our friends told us about this decoy, and they had one." And we're looking, and we're like, "What the heck is?" It? And just tractor beam yeah. right to it. You know. Yeah. yeah. The bird you can't even see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> coming to it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that part of it it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Over home, the uh, paradise shell duck in particular, which is a which is a farmland bird. I mean, it feeds in the feeds on grass. Uh, it'll it'll eat grain like maize or barley, but it's predominantly a grass grass grazer. It kind of acts more like a goose, though, right? But it's a duck. Yeah, it's a shell duck actually. Yeah. So it's halfway between a goose and a paradise duck. Um, your CEO's got two. Stuffed animals on his wall, I see there. So. Yeah. Um, and it's particularly susceptible to decoy, and particularly the robo duck. No, oh, really? You can just use the robo duck and nothing else. And it'll come oh, wow. Right come right in. Yeah. And, and like, they've, they've, they're a big bird, halfway between a duck and a goose in size, but they can really fly. And the aerobatics they do in the air when they come down from a height, mm. you know, exceptional. Like a, like is it the size of our spec here? No, a little bit smaller. Smaller, a little bit smaller. Okay. Yeah. But uh, males black, females uh, chestnut coloured with a white head. Okay. Black black beaks, black feet. Uh, they got a screeching call. That, <laughs> uh, you could call them easily. However, if you're trying to hunt them, you know, trying to sneak up on them, they've got terrific eyesight. You won't get anywhere near them. Really. And uh, they're really, really wily when it comes to that sort of thing. Uh, the deer hunters hate them because you're you're deer hunting up a valley somewhere quietly, like you do when you're hunting. And there's one up the valley and starts screaming. And every <laughs> every deer within Cooey will. Is, did you say they're in the trees too? Like, yeah, is that when they're like they see you and they're in a tree and they start screaming or whatever. Yeah, they um they are a grassland uh, bird, but. When they nest, they not, not always, not all of them, but they'll nest in the tops of trees, very similar to a wood duck, I guess, they've got yeah. over here, which we haven't got in New Zealand. Uh, and then they'll push the young ones out and, you know, hope for the best. But they quite often roost just flying around. They'll land in a tree 
or, or they'll get up on the top of a fence post or whatever. Yeah. Just for a bit more field of view, I guess. Huh. So, they're, yeah, they're very different birds. Yeah. That's interesting. Not, not quite so nice to eat as some mallard, maybe, but <laughs> a little bit stronger tasting. Okay. But otherwise, yeah. What was the bird that you were telling me about that eats other birds? Ah. What was that one? Eats the ducklings. Yeah, it eats the ducklings. Oh, oh, we've got a, that's actually on the game bird list. That's called a pukeko. So pukeko. Pukeko. So it's like a, um, a swamp in basically. Kind of looks like our coot, kind of a different color, right? That's it has a. It's purple. Yeah. Basically, it says it like walks, right? Yeah, it walks. Yeah. yeah, it walks more like a, like a heron or something, I guess. Yeah. It's got feet like that. It's got big long legs, red legs, purple body, red beak, and a white flicking tail that flicks all the time. And when it gets, when it sees you or anything, it really starts flicking to warn everybody else. Very protective of its young. It'll even fight hawks or anything. It'll just, hmm. it's real protective. But when it's got young and the ducks are, ducklings are about, it'll eat all the ducklings. Just, it'll it's just mind blowing to me. Hmm. It'll eat the eggs. It, they're terrible things. The problem is, it's New Zealand's favorite bird. <laughs> they have a competition every year to see which is New Zealand's favorite bird. And almost every year, the Pukeko wins. <laughs> It's inhabited the towns. It's everywhere. Oh, okay. And and even though it's a game bird, not a lot of people hunt it. Uh, because of the game taste or just It's not? quite strong tasting. Yeah. yeah, you just have to cook it different. I mean, it's fine to eat, but it's just... It's probably not like a decoying bird, more like a flush and shoot. Yeah, flush and shoot. No, it doesn't decoy at all. Yeah. It, uh, it tends to run rather than fly. It okay. can fly pretty good, but yeah. it tends to run and hide in the cotton tails. We call it brow poo, but cotton tails and buries itself in there and you've got to get the dog in to get it out or it come out. Well, that's okay. interesting. Yeah. What did you find like the differences in like hunting techniques and how we do things here? Obviously like the duck calling or decoy placement or um, yeah, times when we call the shot or don't call the shot. The, I think the main difference is that you're everywhere I've shot by one or two, the birds don't decoy. Because maybe late season, I don't know. But I mean, Maybe. yeah. Over our way, the birds, we decoy the birds a lot, lot more. We shoot more over the decoys rather than, like the rice fields are a bit different, I guess, because they're shooting overhead mostly. Yeah, you don't get that backpedaling no. shot very, more times than not, it's yeah. a glorified swing over the blind yep. at 15, 20 yards, yeah. and then you shoot them. Yeah. So that's that's probably been the biggest difference. Yeah. Um, and, and even t in the other properties they've been which haven't got blinds where you're shooting out of the toolies or in the stand-up blind same sort of thing really there's very few actual back flapping mm -hmm. mallards in particular yeah uh so that's probably number one uh, decoy placement and yeah, not really we all pretty well kind of think same. the same when it yeah. comes to decoys sure you've got a lot of different species of decoys mm -hmm. we'll just use my own spirit i use uh super super magnum decoys that we either paint black yeah. or we flock black, which is what I do. I flock my decoys black. We use very few drake decoys. We okay. Use, they're all, and, and slowly as the season progresses, we pull all the drake decoys out and just use our black decoys. So that's that's very different over here. You almost go the other way around and have more drake color, yeah. and heads. Um, shooting, as far as calling the shots, not really. Uh, if you could shoot it, shoot it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't matter on, where it is in the skies. So. Yeah, it depends on the situation. Oh, the other the other big difference, of course, is that we're not allowed to shoot ducks on the water. So, oh, that's interesting. No no game is to be shot on the water in New Zealand. It must be in flight. So, what about a cripple? A uh, cripple's different. That's fine. Yeah, cripple's yeah. fine. Yeah, but you cannot, you cannot attempt to shoot at a game bird that is not in flight. It is written in the law. That's crazy because then you have all the law, like you're basically shooting at dark, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you must, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. To be fair, uh, for me personally, I mean, I, I actually shot one on the water here, which I probably haven't a shot a duck on the water yeah. for, I don't know, 10 or 20 years. So. Yeah. For a long time. Um, Sportsmanship, it's, it's all ethics and. That's what it originally was for, yeah. Yeah, ethics of shooting, you know, like, uh, and of course, we're. We were colonised by the English, and they brought a lot of their rules out. 
which to attrition, I guess. Uh, quite a few people, including uh, game wardens and things, that say, "Well, a dead duck's a dead duck, whether it's shot in the air or on the on the on the water." You know. Personally, you can kill a duck easier in the air than you can kill yeah. a duck on the water. Yes, you can. Yeah. No, I yeah. agree. So, what about shots? You are a good shot. Great um, shot. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> For what I hunted with you, use great shot. That's how I felt. Yeah. Um, do most people recreational shoot just to compare, like prepare for waterfowl season? I don't feel like that's as prevalent here anymore. There's like select groups of hunters that do shoot sporting clays and things like that to get ready for duck season to make sure they're better shot. But it seems like here with the people that I know, they're off busy. Like once duck season stops, they're boom, they're in fishing season. And then when fishing season's over, they get to archery season. And there's not a whole lot of prep time for waterfowl season. In terms of shooting, is there? I know you like to shoot um, recreationally. Is that a normal thing? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I mean, I've shot competitively, competitively for a number of years, so it's probably why I'm average, or well, better than average. But I'd say that you were much better than average. <laughs> yeah. uh, your first yeah. four or five shots, you didn't miss. Yeah. Like, all right, well, we'll be all right. It's going to be a good trip. Um, but yeah, generally, our, our, I mean, everybody is geared up three months before the season gets gets that adrenaline rush going. So. So we have rounds of, of, of uh, duck shooter shoots at the gun clubs or, well, now it has to be at gun clubs with our new gun laws. Um, they probably start about mid-February and our duck season opens on the first Saturday in May. So all the gun clubs run those as a fundraiser, of course, but also to encourage duck shooters to come along and, mm-hmm. and try and get better. So... Uh, our gun safety sometimes is uh, is is an area that's a little bit neglected with the duck shooter shoot. Uh, I mean, we've had haven't had any serious incidents, but we've had the odd one that you know you yeah. got, to, got to get a handle on it pretty quick, or they get out of control uh, because they would you're only allowed to fire two shots at a target, but of course they come along with their five shot autos and start mm. blazing, which is Ireland crazy. But otherwise, yeah, and that they, those duck shooter shoots are very well patronised, very well patronised. I mean, you've got prizes up for grabs, and those prizes in general, uh, while the top high overall for the day is it was generally a top sporting clay shooter will win the high overall, but the duck shooters, are, all the prizes are drawn. So, you know, there might be 100 prizes and 120 shooters, so the chance of getting the prize, even if it is something minimal, yeah. you'll get a prize. So that, that draws people out. Very strong, and and you guys are seeing it just like out here, where hu- hunting numbers, hunter numbers are in decline. Correct, hunter numbers are in decline. Uh, like I say, our gun laws are becoming fairly restrictive, like everywhere in the world, I guess. Um, hopefully, with what's happening now, they might rescind one or two of those laws. It seems to be that the uh, the honest person or the, or the serious hunter that has been uh, restricted, you know, has yeah. been penalised by by other individuals that cause the problem. So, right, it happens everywhere in the world, I assume. So, uh, I don't know on what the answer is. Yeah, but one of your guys is <clears> like <throat> if if your spouse doesn't want firearms in the house, right. Do you have to forfeit your firearms to the police? Oh, well, they'll, they'll, they'll come and take them. come and just take them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. wild. Yeah, you could have, you know, a minor argument with your spouse or whatever. And uh, you could just say, well, I'm not, I'm feel, I feel unsafe. There are guns in the house. And, and they'll come and take them out. And then you have to prove that you are able to, an able person to take them. To take them back. But can you bring them back in your house if that person doesn't want them there? Well, you can, but you yeah. have to prove that. Right. Yeah, she will. I mean, in the end, she has to agree. Right. So, otherwise, no. Yeah. yeah. Does somebody always has it worse than us. We think we got bad stuff. When I was talking to Jeff, we they can't even buy choke tubes. Right? No, I can't. Oh, really? Not from here. We can yeah. in New Zealand. Yeah, but like he yeah. can't. He can't buy one in a magazine and have it shipped there. No. 
Yeah, well, and the shipping cost you a couple hundred dollars <laughs> for a forty dollar choke tube. <laughs> yeah, just any gun part. So you the, can you can if you get a permit, but the permit system, of course, like any other bureaucratic thing, takes yeah. a long time and a lot of questions. Yeah. So any outside gun part is basically impossible to get. Yeah. You have to go through the importers, the right channels to be able to do it. But like the sporting goods store doesn't import chokes? Or yes, they yep, do uh, yeah, probably a couple of brands, yep, maybe. Yep, That's yep, about it. Yep, you guys yep. are pretty limited on what you can buy in terms of like brand of decoys or jackets or whatever it may be. Yeah. I've just been through Best Pro Shops, you know, two hours ago sort of thing and, and just... Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a kid in a candy store. Like, yeah. you, know, you could you can buy whatever you want. So, yeah. I mean, that's just one store. Right. Yeah, because you've been to Kittles. Uh, you went to Kittles. Sports Warehouse. Yeah, that was pretty neat. Pretty neat. Actually, Kittles? Uh, Kittles. Yeah, yeah I enjoyed neat. that. I mean, a family atmosphere, friendly. No, it's great. Yeah, and then, you know, Bass that's Pro, yeah. big as it gets. Um, Sportsman's Warehouse, I went there. Yeah. yeah. What did you end up paying f- to um, ship your... Avian X Mojo decoy out? Uh, in the end, I think they cost me $450. Oh. Like. <laughs> per, de- per decoy. Mm. Yeah. That's oh, right. I've, got, I've got one worse than that, though. Like We run the Flashback 2 decoys. Yeah. All right. Over there. Mate and I were the first. Were you guys the first ones to bring them over? Yep. Because, I mean, you, you see those out here now, but it, it's, I'd say, on the – Low end and people using them, they're really, really cool decoys. Talk about what it is, real quick. It's basically a, it's a decoy body, and they have one that the head basically wraps around the body, and, and it looks like it's plunging down yeah. at a duck, and it just is yeah. ripples, and it just really looks like that duck's really coming down. Yeah. It flicks its tail. Yeah. It's yeah. a, a mag- 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 magnetic drive motor. Yeah, so it flips around there, so deep the head goes under, it pulls the yeah. tail up. So what was the charge for that? Should I say? I hope my, <laughs> hope my partner's not uh, listening. <laughs> uh, I think a friend and I bought the first ones, and we bought two, just one each, and they were 800 each in New oh, Zealand. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I've since bought four more. <laughs> uh, to be fair, like, I mean, they're worth the money. They, they yeah. really work well. And like we, where I shoot in particular, the, the pond's quite still water unless we have a pretty strong wind. It's surrounded by by trees, bigger trees, and a lot of smaller stuff, so it's quite sheltered. And um, and the, another thing is that company is fantastic to work with. Mm-hmm. I mean, they'll ship to New Zealand. I had an issue with one of the decoys, and uh, said, oh, can I get a part for it? And he said, that will send you a brand new decoy, which is what he did. Right so on. They're just, they were great, so um, I'll buy more of them. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Talk about your Mai Mai, your, your two-story double-decker. Ah, uh, the Mai Mai, yes. Uh, mine's nice. Uh, I've got a two-story Mai Mai. It's a bottom story, all made out of tin steel frame, okay. steel and wood frame. Uh, so on the on the roof of that, we've got another stand-up blind uh, with an open top on it so you can shoot 360 degrees, which is great. Uh, the bottom story's got bunks in it, uh, pot belly stove you can cook on, gas cooking, hot uh Cold running water. We've got the wash house attached to it. A woodshed, if you want wood. Uh, so when you're hunting, you're you're out there all day until you're done. I generally, yeah, generally, yeah. We're here. We're, even if you do hunt all day, we usually go back, eat some lunch, then go back to the blind later on. I don't. No, yeah, no, there. I, I just dark no, to dark. I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> ah. When I walk away from the blind, I've got to remind myself: do not look back. Yeah. So that's my motto: don't look. But back. I mean, if you got everything in there and you're blind, you know, I probably wouldn't leave either. If I could yeah. go take a nap well, and get well, some I, food and some water, that's I, all I'm doing when I go to lunch. <laughs> I could I could count on one hand where I've actually been the blind and cooked breakfast and ate and stayed around for the whole day yeah. just because a lot of the times we're in layout blinds yeah. or you might be in a boat or something like that and we're um, small rice blind you're not gonna you yeah you don't hang in the room, room right you know sure. or if you're at a refuge yeah you might go hang out in the parking lot or you know go out to the levee and, mm. and take a quick little nap siesta right. slash it would be a lot more enticing if it was just right below me oh it would be awesome <laughs> that's the dream right like you're like a little kid like what kind of blind would you make like i'd have all this stuff and it'd be two stories well, the uh, property next door to me which is probably 500 meters away 
And there's uh, they're blind can sleep fourteen people. So oh my god, they sleep the in the blind. And yep, the blind is part of the front part of the house, if you want oh to call it. House, is the is the blind is the my mind. Yeah. They're surrounded by fairly high willows, so it's it's well covered. And, and uh, the birds don't seem to mind just no, coming. No problem whatsoever. It's wild. I've got their pot belly going all day. You can see the smoke. The birds <laughs> don't even worry. You can smell them cooking. Oh, uh, right my wind, goodness. So. Yeah, and, and by far, that's not the best blind around. Like, it's almost, you know, like something like most hunters who want a new toy and we want a better toy than somebody else. Well, yeah. it's like that with our blinds. That, okay. That we've got to build something better than the guy next door to us, you know. Oh, so, um, yeah, all that goes on. Yeah, but like the duck flight, how can you compare it like when you're in the blind with us? You might see, I don't know, let's call it 10,000 ducks flying just wherever, geese, you got ducks. Your guys' bag limit's higher than ours, but like I told you earlier, like a lot of people don't shoot a limit here. Mm-hmm. Like that's probably the norm where you guys are shooting, or yourself, you're, you're shooting a limit when you go out majority of the time. Majority of the time. Yeah. Right. But you're seeing way less ducks migrating or flying around your area. Correct. Yeah, some some days I might only see 50 ducks yeah. like in the morning, uh, but I'll shoot my limit out of those. Yeah. yeah. That's that's the difference. I mean, opening day, depending on the year, I mean, we've had some fairly, like last year, for example, uh, we had a pretty dry season and the birds weren't in the swamp. The birds normally come up into the swamp to rest. They go out to the paddocks or the maize fields or wherever to feed. Mm-hmm. They come back into the swamp to rest up for the day and, uh, and then fly out again at night. So those birds weren't there before the season. And it wasn't until we got rain, the third, third or fourth day of the season, that the birds all came back into the swamp. But we still shot well. Like when I say there weren't that many birds there opening two or three days, there were a lot of birds in the air. And we shot limits, four of us shot limits easily. Gotcha. So both three days, so, and then the rain hit, and from there on, that's what made the rest of the season, really, because the birds returned and the bird numbers were high, but nothing like what I've seen out here. Ah. Like, I mean, you will say it's been a poor season, but the, wherever I go, there's... <laughs> <laughs> there are thousands of birds. <laughs> You've just got to get them to come to your blind, I guess. But yeah, you know, it just can be challenging, right? Yeah. 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 What's been your favorite bird that you've harvested this trip? Oh, the pintail. The pintail? Yeah, the old bull pintail, pretty yeah. special. And the canvas back eluded. Yes, the canvas back. Well, that's going to be the bane of my life. <laughs> yeah. I'm absolutely gutted that I didn't didn't get a canvas back. And I had the opportunity. Like I thought it was actually a better shot than that, but that's probably why I missed it. But yeah, the one opportunity and and uh, let it go. So, yeah, disappointing. But I've got a good reason to come back. Yeah. 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 Now you knocked down a lot. Well, let's count them. You got snow goose, speck, mallard, pintail, widgeon. Teal. Gadwall, green wing teal, and cinnamon teal. Cinnamon yep. teal. Yep. Uh, you got your golden eye. Yep. Uh, blue bull. <laughs> blue bill. <laughs> yeah, I got the blue bill. You got the shoveler. Yep. Did you shoot a uh, buffalo head on that diver trip or no? No. No buffalo. All heads. golden eye. No. Uh, what's the other? Oh, what's that? Buffalo head. Yeah. Buffalo head. Yeah. Buffalo head. Buffalo head. Yeah. Buffalo head. yeah. 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 I actually got that at um, the teal club. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And no ring neck. I don't know if we. Oh, I never got a ring neck. Yeah. Might have one tomorrow. Ring necks, ring necks were shot, but I never. Okay. Yeah. Neck, potentially tomorrow. Um, but, like, you look at that, that's awesome. 12, I mean, 12 13 different species. Yeah. 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 yeah, compared to probably, I probably only shoot three species at home. So <laughs> yeah. That's predominant in my area. So. Yeah. I think that's what's, like, um, really neat about our state is you can go out and in one day, and shoot over five different species in the same bag limit, yeah. you know, where a lot of places they do just primarily shoot a lot of mallards and like in Idaho and things like that. Um, mm. where you're on the rice, mm. you have no idea what's well, coming, yeah. Yeah, that's that's you know, I mean, we go out hunting expecting to shoot a lot of birds, I guess, but we go out there because you don't know what's going to happen, yeah. You know, it's that anticipation for. Well, the unexpected, I guess. Yeah, keeps you coming back. Yeah, it keeps you coming back. Yeah. Keeps that adrenaline rush going. Yeah. And it has done for 
70 years. So. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure hosting you out here, and um, glad to hear that you had a fantastic time, and you've just been an, an awesome guest to have out here, and it's been a pleasure sharing the blind with you, eating, um, chalking it up in the car. It's been a lot of fun, so thank you so much for coming out, and we appreciate you joining us on the podcast. Oh, um, Like I said, I've got no complaints, and I'd uh, really like to thank all the members of California Waterfowl for uh, – putting up with me yeah. <laughs> um, and the organization's been amazing and I'm the whole organization that you have here compared to what we've got in New Zealand is just absolutely I just can't believe it you know yeah. like we've got nothing that even minorly compares to what you people have got mm-hmm. so like we're all getting pressured anti hunters stuff like that excessive gun laws and you people are doing a fantastic job to try and combat all that and conserve uh, the waterfowl population, conserve habitat. That's amazing, you know. And I've, and I've become a life member because was, of, because of that. As I say, you're helping the fight. You're our newest life member. There so you go. Thank yeah. you. We appreciate yeah, that. I, I, you know, you've done a lot for me, and I think I should try and put something back. So I've taken a lot out of waterfowl <laughs> over the years. <laughs> yeah. I've always tried to put something back there. So. Yeah, always That's appreciate great. it. Yeah, we do appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, Thank thanks, you, Jeff. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Save It for the Blind podcast. You can find our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.